Hi, thank you so much. Thank you, Agatha. Um, um, it's really nice to be here. I'm, I'm, I'm used to talking very much about my own work, so this is I'm slightly outside of my comfort zone. But um, for the last year and a half, I've made it my mission to to discuss hydrogen and to talk to everyone I meet. And my poor wife is very bored by this perpetual conversation that I have with literally everyone I meet socially, um, because I've been sort of very um, just, well, first, firstly, I think that hydrogen, it's changed a lot in the last year, but it's still re relatively not that much known about it in terms of the public consciousness. And I think it's so fundamental to the future of us, of a, state, a sustainable future that it's just, and I'm so worried that the sort of market forces and the dominance of, and the rush towards um, electric may, we may make the wrong decisions, a bit like VHS and Betacam or, the, the way that Volkswagen um, lobbied big business 20 years ago to sort of um, lobby the government to um, to move towards diesel, and I, I just feel that there is a there's a really there's, it's very very important for the um, the public and for everyone to understand the potential of hydrogen and some of its histories and and what it what it is. I mean, I think that um, I've been quite amazed over the last few months at how little some people that I I mean Extinction Rebellion would seem to be not that aware of it a few months ago and so i've been trying to deal with talk to them about hydrogen and its potential and i had a, there was a climate emergency at the tate where i spoke about it to about 100 artists one morning and it seems like it is we are beginning to see it appear in public consciousness and and, and appearing in, on the radio now and in the news but it hasn't until relatively recently been part of the equation and um, so I was just going to talk a little bit about it, introduce it a bit to everyone. Um, I mean, from an artist's point of view, I've been, I mean, until this year with the COVID crisis, I, I mean, I, if it was a year, if I cast my mind back a year and a half ago, I was, the, there was, a, I was a deeply affected by, as we all are, by the sort of world and the state of the world. And, and I was really sort of, it was really sort of threatening my pleasure at making things because I was looking at the objects that I make and instead of seeing these, these things that I adored and I would cherish, I was still seeing them in a different way. I suddenly are these reckless, uh, unnecessary indulgences that were carbon, I was seeing its carbon footprint. And so the pleasure of making was really, I was having a bit of a crisis as an artist. And I was thinking I've got to try and separate my, my industry, my, my making from my carbon footprint or my, my bank my turnover can't just be linked linearly to my carbon footprint. I mean, there must be a way of trying to separate these out. And, and the first thing, of course, that and I'm sure a lot of you already have done this, but the first sort of low hanging fruit that we can all do is as individuals or as business owners is to move to a green energy tariff for our electricity. And that apparently, according to um, Extinction Rebellion, actually overnight, without it costing you any more money, will reduce your carbon footprint by up to 40% which is really extraordinary. But also what that does is if more than, at the moment, 33% of the UK is produced through wind. And uh, so if, but if more than a third of the country sign up to green energy tariffs, it just sucks all the money out, all the investment out of the traditional uh, power generation systems and into the renewables. Um, the other, so the, one of the problems that the UK is gonna face, we've got this right race towards, um, uh, towards a sort of the, the wind, wind and, and solar and all these te uh, renewable technologies, but um, as we as the percentage increases, as the slice of the pie increases um, uh, from th a third to a half to two thirds, we'll have this increased risk of when the wind isn't blowing of how we generate our electricity. And this has always been one of the arguments against wind is that the wind is not always blowing, the sun is not always shining, um, and at the moment at night when the wind is blowing just as strongly. Um, there is no storage of the electricity. So there's a third of the electricity is sort of wasted. Um, and hydrogen really, in terms of a process, it's, it's very simple the way that hydrogen is produced. There's complexity in the way that it's stored, but hydrogen is produced simply by um, bubbling, uh, by passing electricity through purified water. So in the, in the northern, in the northern uh, countries of Europe, we have ample, ample amounts of water and ample amounts of, um, of, of wind. So the um, so at night the, the the idea and the sort of hope is that hydrogen will become an incredibly um, ubiquitous source of energy storage, 
And so hydrogen can not only be used, and it's also that the breadth of, of, of um, the ways that hydrogen can be used is extraordinary. It's not just to power cars, which is actually a very small part of the equation. Um, it can be used to, at the moment, there are experiments going on where 20% of the gas grid in Europe is being spliced with hydrogen, green hydrogen produced through wind. And so you're beginning to see um, uh, the, the, nat the natural gas um, thing, which is carbon heavy, being spliced with this carbon neutral product. And so over time, more and more of, the, of, um, of our um, ways that we cook on our stoves and the way that we use our gas boilers can become green hydrogen as we produce more of it and store more of the wind energy at night. So, um, so you've got um, heating in homes, you've got infrastructure of lorries and heavy goods vehicles, you've got um, shipping, again, where the, um, these traditional kind of very, very um, high cons consummation um, ships can be run on hydrogen. Uh, and the end game is really then there's aviation, which, is, which will be a few years away, but the um, aviation, the jet engine can run on hydrogen. You have to change the, um, the design of the fuselage, but, um, but essentially because, of, because it's, a very, it's a gas at room temperature, you have, to, you have to create a very sort of um, strong chamber for it to be, um, for it to be stored inside. Um, but essentially we've got this full, this full range of possibilities with this. And, my, my concern with the, the, the sort of acceleration of the market forces of say Tesla is that, um, is that we are with governments, with governments being very time poor and not necessarily experts within this field, they're being pressured by big business. And there's so much money to be made out of the sort of green revolution. But it's very, very important that the public are, are made aware as much as possible of the options. Because I feel that while if, if in 10 years time, if 80% of Europe is driving uh, lithium cobalt based cars, we may as a, as a continent reduce our carbon footprint to a, down to a certain level. And we may all feel satisfied driving our cars because our individual footprint is lower. But the reality of the problem is it's not, it's not a genuine solution because the carbon footprint of extracting the cobalt, the politics involved in, 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 the South, in South America and in Africa, of extracting the cobalt and the lithium, of removals of whole mountain ranges is gonna create huge environmental problems, but also political problems for these regions. And it's a sort of, a, I guess, in, a, in the most tough way of describing it, it's a sort of carbon laundering. So we, we as, a, as a continent of Europe may say, oh, we've, we've reduced our carbon by this amount, but actually we're just sending it all off to these poor, um, poor nations to deal with and the, to deal with the environmental impacts and the and the political sort of upheaval of these sort of fights over lithium and cobalt. And so we're replacing the, the fight, the sort of war, the unrest in the Middle East over oil with the unrest over, over, over cobalt. And there is no long-term solution for also the disposal of the batteries. With hydrogen, there is, um, the batteries are entirely, they have a fuel cell battery inside. They are still electric cars, but they are entirely re recyclable or the hydrogen can be produced locally and it completely bypasses the issue of, um, of carbon. So it's a beautiful cycle of, um, of water, which you then split that into oxygen and hydrogen. And then the hydrogen is, is, is burnt. It's a flammable, hydrogen is very flammable. You, you, um, you burn it um, in that you ignite it and it, form, it just turns back into water when it combines with oxygen. And you can drink the water from the exhaust of a car that, um, that, that is run on hydrogen. So there is sort of an amazing kind of cyclical sort of thing and it's, uh, hydrogen is one of the most abundant um, elements in the universe, the molecules in the universe. It's, um, and they'll, in a thousand years time, there will be just as much hydrogen as there is now. And we, we do, I think, have the opportunity to, um, I mean, I really see it as a sort of inevitability, but my concern is that we just don't have the time to spend 10, 15 years going down this lithium cobalt route um, and for only to discover that actually there's not enough lithium and not enough cobalt. To, and we, we've just got to get on with the right decisions in order to halt the, the climate strike crisis as quickly as possible. But I think that, I mean, hydrogen is really, I've been so depressed as we all have by, by the sort of unfolding sort of catastrophe and the sort of realization of what we're doing to the world. And, I've sort of looked at all the sort of scenarios and 
ways we can limit our energy, uh, try and sort of create a sort of an energy communism or energy, energy socialism. And of course, we need to curtail the amount of, um, of meat that we eat and things like this. But I'm a strong believer that actually the solution is not to halve our energy, halve our energy footprints, but to create an abundant carbon free energy that will, um, that will have no consequence. We, um, it's not, I don't think it's realistic for us all to go down to 50% energy because even if we were to be able to do that, if the population of the world doubles in the next 50 years, we're just back to square one. What we need to create is a, um, an abundant uh, um, an energy that has this no, 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 no consequence. And I, I really believe while there, there are issues of containerization and logistics and expense with hydrogen that through, through, the, um, through its enlargement and it's through um, the scale of economics, it will become a very affordable, a very bountiful and ubiquitous system that you can produce in the, in, around the equator using solar and desalination of the sea. So Saudi Arabia can produce it, Norway, Sweden can produce it through wind and through, through uh, uh, the pl plentiful water that they have up there. I mean, it's, it's really, it's really um, within the grasp of most countries in the world. Australia is embracing it. Japan has abandoned its nuclear program and is embracing a, few, uh, a hydrogen future. Europe is very much poised to sort of invest a lot in it. Um, Korea, Hyundai, Toyota are all, um, are all poised to do this. And um, I really feel that but for some reason, hydrogen is not in the public consciousness enough. Um, and I think every billionaire in the world will also want to have a private jet that is run on hydrogen, so they don't have to have that feeling of anxiety, and they can and they can boast about their carbon footprint being negative. And Bill Gates has commissioned a super yacht that runs on hydrogen. It's 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 so this this revolution is is out there, but it's just not. It, if for some reason it's not being discussed enough, and I worry that the sort of Tesla sort of market forces will land us in a sort of terrible, a bit of a disaster with our, with this, just this, this legacy of um, millions of lithium batteries, which we just can't afford to, um, to make right now. We, we really need to sort of shift directly towards, um, towards a hydrogen future. Um, just going off that, can I ask you a quick question, Conrad, that I yeah. think I'm seeing um, in the chat? Um, about kind of um, one person, I don't know if this was more a comment of, or a question, but I just wanted to hear your thoughts um, about whether it was like hydrogen and renewables versus fossil fuels um, or like hydrogen versus renewables and how we should shift the focus, whether we should like have kind of um, hydrogen and renewable energy together or um, whether it's kind Absolutely. of- Absolutely. Well, I mean, hydrogen has been around for a long time and there is a distinction between something called blue, blue hydrogen and green hydrogen. Um, to, to produce hydrogen takes a lot of energy. To split to split water into um, into hydrogen and oxygen takes a great deal of electricity. So it's always been, and it, in, in the past, before the, re, the advent of renewable energy, hydrogen was a, quite a carbon intensive process. And it was produced for a number of different uh, things. It's used a lot in farming, so it relates to the talk before in and ammonia and things like this. Um, but, um, but it's it's only because of the advent of um, of renewable energy and the and the fact that all these turbines aren't being used at night when the wind is still blowing that there's a real suddenly that the, at the very least a third of our a third of our energy should be stored in hydrogen uh, when when people aren't using their electricity at night so the the um the, the definitely the the hydrogen is completely dependent and and completely intertwined with uh, renewable energy, both solar and um, and uh, and wind, and so they cannot they, they cannot sort of exist without each other. So it, it's absolutely part of that whole um, production line that um, that they need to exist together in tandem. Great, thank you so much for that. Um, just going off that with another kind of comment and question um, related to that as well, kind of about um, you're talking about cars and kind of replacing electric cars by hydrogen powered cars. But um, what do you think about um, not really focusing on replacing one-to-one -one cars, but more on promoting like pedestrian public or public transport bicycles and electric bikes that don't require like any type of electricity or hydrogen. Um, well, the, I think of course, I mean, uh, bicycling around, I mean, there are two, I think there are two, bicycling around cities is, is gonna improve everyone's um, quality of life. 
And I think it's what's really interesting recently with the um, with the the low emission zones in London. And actually, the 20 years ago, there was the, the Volkswagen was very um, instrumental in lobbying uh, government to move towards a diesel based sort of economy and subsidizing diesel cars. And actually, at the time, that was based on an environmental um, argument that diesel you would do more my, more kilometers per liter with a diesel car than a petrol car. So it was about trying to go further with less. But of course, what was not um, considered at the time as important was air quality. And so interestingly, the, the, the banning of diesel is not to do with so much uh, a kind of global warming thing, but actually to do with uh, human health. And so there's an interesting thing of shifting of the of the um, which one is more important, vying from what is more important, and in some ways, um, the, uh, the, 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 the 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 sort of going towards a petrol car. It actually you are going to create more carbon per mile when you drive a petrol car than a diesel car, but the sulfates and all the pollutants and all the carcinogens in diesel is just far worse. So um, so I completely agree that we should sort of try and. Um, complete and sort of try and take back the cities, but also the cities, I suppose, I do defend the fact I have a, a, a factory, a studio in London, and we, we want to make things here. We're on a green energy tariff. We try to use couriers that are um, uh, kind of net zero um, couriers. Um, we, I'm desperately trying to decarbonize my supply chain by, like your last speaker was saying about, um, about using your your uh, voting with your feet, so we we've been trying to get our laser cutters and our our mill our the mills that make our steel to be to take adopt green energy tariffs, but it's quite difficult. I mean, I think that's the um, with heavy industry the the ability to go on to green energy tariffs is not just not possible yet. So across Europe, the production of steel, for example, is incredibly dirty, incredibly um, polluting, and um, both on a carbon you know from a carbon point of view and from a pollutant point of view. So these things are, again, hydrogen is, has the potential to completely clean up um, the kind of construction industry in that all the mills will run off, off have, they'll have sort of hydrogen facilities. And you see all these across the coastline of England or across Europe, you have all these um, uh, uh, petrol facilities, these big kind of tanks that, or, or cylinders that contain the refineries. But all of those, I think, I predict, and I was talking to um, a colleague at um, ITM Power who was saying all of those old refineries will become electrolyzers for for um, for hydrogen, and then those will be shipped to uh, mills, and the mills will locally uh, either produce they could either produce their own hydrogen with a turbine that, uh, that that produces electricity, and when it, at night stores hydrogen. So you can have it on a local scale, on a micro scale, or on a, on a national grid level. But I think it the hydrogen has the potential. To um, to decarbonize all sorts of areas of our um, of our life, and I'm I'm my hope is that in the next ten years I can find a way that my the my my artistic output is no longer having a detrimental impact on on my environment, and I'm really I'm sort of first time in a long time I've sort of can see a a sort of a silver bullet solution here that I really I genuinely believe in, and I think it's um. It's super exciting. I mean, it's um, and I just, I just all advise you all. And I'm not an expert in this, so I may be saying things that isn't entirely accurate. But I'm, an, I'm an artist who has become infused by this idea, and I really see this thing being a potential to really get us out of a serious problem. But I just implore you all to read as much about it as you can, and um, inve investigate it, and be skeptical about batteries just because, just because we're told we have to buy battery cars, just. Um, just be a bit skeptical about it and do some research into it. I think that um, that there is, if we race too quickly into this solution, we we may really regret it. Yeah, definitely, um, Conrad. Thank you so much for that. And kind of going off, um, obviously, as you're saying, like the huge potential of carbon, um, because it has such a great potential. I think we could um, could you briefly discuss just obviously its risks because it has such a big potential, like. What is the risk like if, for example, it's not produced cleanly um, and in the correct way? Um, well, so, the, I mean, the main risks, I mean, you're, you're all very familiar with the, um, the Hindenburg disaster. I mean, the Zeppelin that blew up in uh, the Nazi airship. And that was, um, 
kind of it, it gave it's obviously given hydrogen quite a bad name but it sort of was an extraordinary sort of uh sort of bad decision to sort of fill an airship with not helium but hydrogen i don't know where, how that ever came about but it was um it was essentially incredibly potent flammable gas inside a canvas bag um so and just millions of liters of of it and it sort of created this catastrophic explosion um and so that was um obviously there's a there's a there's an issue with it being more more much more volatile than say, traditional in that it's a gas at room temperature you need to inside a, um, a hydrogen based car there it you have a cylinder inside or a sphere that's actually made of kevlar and it's a really uh, finely knitted kevlar ball because the molecule is very very small uh, it can seep out through um, through sort of uh, more traditional structures, and so it has to. It's this Kevlar ball, and it's kept right in the center of the car. So there are there are there are sort of increased sort of risks in terms of volatility, but um, I think it's just a question of um, containerization. Though, so instead of putting the nozzle in your petrol tank, you put a you would put a, a clip on and so turn it sideways, click it in, and it would have a valve like with a welding bottle or um, uh, laughing uh, like a, um, filling up a helium balloon you have um kind of a, a just a, a sort of a valve on it which you open and close so there are just there are systems you just have to create the systems which um allow it to um to uh, be safe but I, i'm i mean i'm sure like with car crashes and things like that there will be there will be explosions i mean there's not it's inevitable that will happen i think in in terms of but i don't think it will be any more than if the if the technology is 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 designed correctly, there will only be more. I mean, with aviation, I mean, I've always thought that it was whoever came up with the idea that of storing the aviation fuel in a wing was quite a, a, a daring one. Uh, to say the least, it seems like the most exposed area to keep all your most flammable liquid. But um, with with um, with with aviation, uh, there would the wings would become um, would be actually become places where people would sit inside. The wings would be much fatter. We create a much more dart-like plane, and then the, the the fuel will be kept in the fuselage in a much safer area of the plane. Um, and the, but the advantage of this is that literally it produces instead of producing huge amounts of carbon in the air, it just produces steam behind you. It's very it's really beautiful in terms of the what what the actual just of the byproducts. And I think so. I think there are there will be um, need for very rigorous controls, and and how it's distributed will have to be very very careful. But I don't think, with the right design, that it'll be any more dangerous than um, than uh, than than aviation fuel or petrol or diesel. What do you think? Um, because obviously the crisis of today is incredibly urgent, and there's a lot of focus on the urgency, how we we're running out of time and we need to find solutions. But do you think, in some ways, um, this sense of urgency can be um, dangerous because, as you said, we're going to jump to to solutions that we haven't thought through completely. We haven't thought through the long-term impact, or for example. Um, not considering like the risks and the dangers, do you think that um, this sense of urgency is also in some way dangerous um, in this sense? I yes, I, I absolutely, and I think uh, um, anything done hastily is is has has huge risks. I think that and government is lobbied by big business, and I think that um, by the nature of government, there is a short termism with things rather than a long termism in terms of the dem democratic cycle. So there is huge. Um, and I think I think the arguments that Extinction Rebellion have been making, for example, of having a, a kind of uh, um, a kind of a council, a, a civic council, where a body of people that sort of really just sort of looks at this this emergency and um, tries to enact um, really good policy over a longer period of time would are, re are really sort of sound ideas. Um, the um, I think that yeah, I mean, I think I, I'm I'm not a I'm not a um, I don't, I'm not a big believer in nuclear, so I think that the recent decision of the UK to sort of build a nuclear power station is not necessarily the right one. I think there is a problem with, we cannot rely entirely on wind because of the fact that um, it won't always be blowing. Um, but at the same time, I think that nuclear has so many potential risks. And if you take, and, and I think Germany has abandoned its nuclear program after what happened in Japan, I think that the idea that we can always predict the future is and and um, is is a foolish one. So I think um, I'm not a, I'm not an advocate of nuclear as a as a way forward. How do you think um, hydrogen fueled stations can compete? 
Well, that's a, that's a very good question. And I think that's the thing, that's why I'm trying to talk about this as much as possible, because I think the power of communication and the conversation is incredibly um, potent. And um, I think we are beginning to see, I mean, in California, they've been, they, they're embracing hydrogen. They're very, very ahead of the game in, in California. Um, I think that, I, d I don't think that we're not gonna see electric cars. I think that there will be a, there will be a whole um, kind of um, um, cosmology of solutions. And I don't think hydrogen is the only solution, but I think it should be a significant part. So a third or a half of our, of our transportation needs should be filled by this. I think trains and and buses and um, freight can only be run by hydrogen. I think the idea of um, these uh, of, of electric trucks that are going to do these long haul journeys is, is never going to work. Uh, also, um, in the Amaz Amazon warehouses, for example, they can't have forklifts that run on batteries because it takes so long because they run 24 hours a day. They um, they need to they can't charge them for 12 hours. It doesn't make sense. So the hydrogen again is is a very much kind of leading the industry within forklift um, um, containerization and and logistics within warehouses, but I think um, I think it will compete. I think that um, it's it it has to be part of the if you have a if you have a uh, a, um, a country which has a significant wind uh, wind as a significant part or solar as a significant part of its solution, you have to be able to store it somehow. And batteries are just not, you can't create batteries for the whole of Europe to store our electricity. It has to be stored uh, hydroelectrically. So if you've got big mountains and lakes, you can pump water up and store it through potential energy. But most of the world doesn't have that potential. Hydrogen is really, I think, the, it's going to emerge as, as a huge, a huge significant slice of, of our energy um, storage needs. And I think that, um, yeah, I think that car, there will, I predict and I hope that, um, at least 30 to 50 percent of of our of our vehicles in the future will be hydrogen based but we're behind and that's why i need why i'm the urgency of why i talk about it is that i i think that i'm not a fan of um of sort of elon musk um in the sense that i i don't think he's an environmentalist i think he's an incredible businessman but i think the ethos of the company is not one that is trying to solve it's a market disruptor and it's incredible what he's achieved but I don't see his agenda being one that is actually trying to reduce the carbon footprint of of transportation. I see it as a sort of uh, a incredible disruptor, but and an innovator, and a sort of genius on many levels. But it isn't, um, and he won't acknowledge hydrogen. He calls it full cells. He's sort of he's in denial about its potential. And there is a sort of uh, interesting in the next year or so. There's going to be a big clash. Should be really interesting to see about how he deals with the advent of this fuel and this technology and uh it's a bit like the beta cam and vhs wars in the 80s or something it'll be there's a big um showdown that's coming that will be really interesting to uh to watch because he's a very smart intelligent man and i think he has to at some point acknowledge uh hydrogen's place in the transportation sector 